So, <clears throat> let's role play real quick. I'm a friend of yours, and I tell you guys about this cool new email app coming out called Polite Persistence. I say it's going to change the way that we email. And I want you to check it out. Here's a link to, our, to an Indiegogo campaign, and take a look and tell me what you think. So you say, oh my god, another person asking me for money, but I'm a friend, I'll check it out. So you click the video link that is sent to you. Customized proposed options and an auto turn off feature when someone replies that we even make Jason look polite. Obviously, I'm an emailologist and not a web developer, which is why we really need your help. In return, we're giving our backers exclusive licenses to access polite persistence before we launch, since it won't be available to the general public immediately. Thanks for checking us out. Now, please excuse me while I do my part to keep our landfills empty. But remember, save time. Email one. He actually put that chainsaw right through right through a light when that happened. <laughs> all right, so let's get back to the, the thing. All right. Let's see where is this right so, you're done watching the presentation. You turn to your friend. You say, "That's great. It's sort of funny, but I have a couple questions. Right. What problem are they solving? What does the product do? And why should I care?" And this was exactly why our campaign failed and why our video didn't get the traction that it should have. Because what was happening was people were going to play persistence who had no idea what play persistence was. They'd watch the video and then still have no idea what play persistence was, and that was an issue. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is a couple things that we learned along the way from our experience and some pitfalls that you guys can avoid. That ideally, it won't happen to you when you pursue your crowdfunding dream. But first, who are we? So. That wonderful prego up there is uh, my lovely wife, Paula, and the co-founder of Play Persistence. And unfortunately, she's not here today because we have a baby coming in about six weeks. Okay. Uh, so hopefully, uh, Play Persistence can be off the ground before then. I don't know, we'll see. Um, I heard I'll be pretty busy when that happens. But um, you know, my background is in uh, financial services, private equity, and management consulting most recently. And her background is uh, you know, the media sciences and literature. Not exactly the kind of backgrounds you would expect from you know, two tech co-founders, I guess, essentially. So speaking of you know, starting a tech company, you know, what are we doing? And if you couldn't figure it out from the sounds of chainsaws and leaf blowers from the video, uh, Play Persistence is the fastest, friendliest, and easiest way to get a response over email guaranteed. So more from a technical standpoint, we are actually a Gmail browser extension that's basically built for the average email user people who uh, are independent sales reps, or people who are just casual networkers, or mainly anybody who hates following up by email, or knows they should follow up, but don't, they don't do it. And that's essentially what we're doing. So, when we, had, when we started our campaign, we had these, these great visions of ruling the world and generating tons and tons of money. 
But the reality was, that wasn't the case. And we were pretty sad by the time the campaign ended, obviously. Which is why we're here. So, the thing is, is that at the end of the campaign, there were a lot of puzzle pieces to pick up. And we had to figure out what was going on, what caused this issue, why, why did no one really want to back us. I mean, we did raise some money, but not the money we needed. And uh, there were lessons here that we had to derive from this entire process and experience. So, uh, I have three polite lessons for not blanking up your crowdfunding opportunity when the time comes. And those lessons are basically um, focusing on email lists, which uh, Jason covered a little bit, actually. Um, so if you want to include humor into your video, we talk about humor and the story balance a little bit. And the third is prototypes. So the first problem that we faced was that we were just too excited to get started with crowdfunding. We were so excited that we let this, um, well, sort of as, 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 as excited as this kid oh, getting a new uh, comic book, it looks like. But we were so excited that we let the emotions of you know, having a crowdfunding campaign sort of blur our, our, our vision. And we rushed into this campaign with these delusions of grandeur and uh, the feeling that anyone who just looks at our campaign is going to absolutely fall in love with what we're doing and that was going to be end the end of it. And unfortunately, you know, reality uh, has no mercy. So the problem was, you know, right out of the gate, we had no real true email list. Uh, you know, we had people that, you know, we were gathering friends and family and doing all that. But like Jason said, he had a, I think it was 3,000, 3,000 person email list. And we didn't have that. We wanted to get there. Actually, Scott even mentioned that to me from Busyhood when we presented in front of the AIG, uh, is that right? AIG. AIG. That, you know, do you, how many people do you have signed up previously? And we didn't have that many. And that was a major issue. Because when you're doing crowdfunding, statistically they say, you should be able to raise a third of your goal in the first week to be successful. So having a, success, having a solid email list of that 3,000 or, or whatever you have is going to give you that real strong push out of the gate to get you started and to hit that you know, third of your funding to, to get on the go-go factor, to get on to all these different types of uh, you know, the little algorithms that they have set up for you. And we were nowhere near that. So, that. so what do you do if you don't have an email list, right? Well, first step is to slow it down. Because we were excited, but you know, so I was talking to some people before and they have ideas for crowdfunding campaigns. But when do you think about launching it? Are you launching it next week, next month? Whenever you're launching it, add another three, four, five months to that. Because that's how long you're going to need to seriously prepare and grow your email list. It's really, in my opinion, in, in that early stage, all about the email list. The second step is to breathe a little bit. Because you know, crowdfunding is nowhere near a, a get money quick scheme. And I'd say that up to 70% of your energy is going to be spent before the campaign even launches. Uh, so think about that for a sec. So third, you should go out there and sign up for MailChimp if you're not currently using an email marketing provider now. MailChimp's free, and they give you uh, up to 2,000 subscribers for free. So your goal should be, if you don't have this and you plan on running a crowdfunding campaign, to go out there and sign up for MailChimp and do whatever it takes, whatever it takes, to get that 2,000 subscriber mark. Because if you don't have that, then don't even bother trying to start a crowdfunding campaign. And that's something we learned the hard way. Consider it a prerequisite. If you're not getting this 2,000 mark, and don't even bother trying to, to raise the funds. And obviously when you get that, great. Now go run your campaign. Something we're doing now that we learned and we should have done so sooner was that we put together this great ebook. It's called The Top Email Templates for Turning Contacts You Meet into Customers. And that's getting a lot of great traction. We got a bunch of subscribers from that and that's something we should have done before we can launch the campaign. <clears throat> so the second lesson is our humor story balance. Now not everybody wants to go out there and have a a funny video, and I can tell by all your dying laughter that our video was absolutely hilarious. But um, you know, the thing is, if you're going to do that, then you want to have to you want to have to have a nice balance. So the quote I have here is, uh, "Storytelling is the game, and it's why Vince McMahon makes a billion dollars." Gary Vaynerchuk, who is a prominent blogger, but it's true. Vince McMahon is an awesome storyteller. Now, regardless of how you feel about the World Wrestling Federation, you know he knows how to bring the balance of story and humor together for an awesome experience, which so many people come out to enjoy. So the problem was, was that with polite persistence, you know, we were sacrificing, <laughs> we were sacrificing that emotional connection for a party boying Jason with a chainsaw. And that just, you know, that just wasn't hitting, it wasn't getting the mark, it wasn't getting the job done. Um, and you know, the, the really what you should do is, if you have too much, well if you have too much storytelling and not enough humor, you're a soap opera, right? But if you have too much humor and not enough storytelling, Sort of like what we were, you're more of an improv skit. So it's like, you know, you sort of have to have that, that nice balance in between. I don't know if anyone here has heard of uh, the crowdfunding campaign of Who Gives a Crap? Anyone here hear that? Nobody? Really? 
Well, you guys should watch it if you're ever considering having a funny crowdfunding video. And we could watch it, but it's going to take time, and it's linked there. I don't know if you want to watch it or not. But anyway, so they do a great job because they focus on their story, but then bring all the funny elements in from like the background and from, uh, and from what he's doing. So he's actually sitting on a toilet the entire time of the video. And it's hilarious because the guy's being very straight face. It's a great, great, you know, well-produced video. And it, you know, it blew, it blew the numbers off. And my thing, after watching that and seeing what we did, you know, I would go back and I, this is what I would do. I would say, okay, well, let's figure out the story first. Everybody has a story. Yeah. Um, and I'd figure out in a way of it, do it through a use case. And I'll show you uh, an example of what a use case story looks like. But do it first without any humor. And then if you want to add humor, go back and ask some of your funniest friends, people you know who have a great personality, to come in and sort of collaborate with you on this. Think about your, the funniest TV shows on TV. What do you guys like? I mean, I like Modern Family, right? Yeah. And my thing is, you know there's not one person sitting in a room coming up with all the Modern Family jokes. There's a group of people sitting in a room, the writer's room, bouncing ideas off people, having a great time. And that's no different than the way you should run your crowdfunding video if you want it to be humorous. You gotta have a bunch of people in there throwing ideas back and forth and build it that way, but then incorporate those ideas into the story that you already have structured first, because that's the most important thing. So once you have your 2,000 subscribers and you have your story, yeah, then go ahead and plan your crowdfunding campaign. An example of this that I can show you quickly is what we did now for our use case story. And this is something that, once again, we should have done before we launched the campaign, because what it does is it puts everything in perspective. And if you can't put things in perspective for the user, for the person who is potentially going to be backing you, then you really don't have much, much of a platform to stand on. So <clears throat> just to give you a quick example of what, uh, if this loads in time, if it doesn't, we'll just keep going. But uh, all right, it looks like it's not loading. All right, well, oh, OK, here it is. So essentially, what it looks like is, well, it's really slow. Anyway, there's a lot more graphics and stuff. But you have a story here, and it's a, it's a, it's a story that goes through the process where you meet this guy, Mike who sends a lot of emails, right? He just came back from a, from a technology conference and he met a bunch of people, similar to where we are today, right? And he wants to follow up with this one particular woman, her name's Janet. So he goes in and he actually fills out, he opens up Polite Persistence, which you would see here if it loaded, and he would fill out all his tabs and basically showing the way the product works. Now he would fill out all his follow-up emails in one compose screen. Then as time goes on, Janet would get the first email, but she's busy. She's at a work meeting, she has to bring her kids to soccer practice, she has to go grocery shopping, and naturally she forgets about the email that Mike originally sent. Mike goes on to do his own thing, and play persistence while well, stays persistent. It sends Janet the next follow-up email in the string, as it's supposed to do, and Janet, who gets it and has a little more time, is like, oh wow, now I can actually respond to Mike. I, I forgot about him, but I wanted to connect with him, and now he, she follows up. So what happens is Mike, on the other hand, which there's nothing even here, so Mike, on the other hand, is able to go off and hang out with his clients, his customers, maybe his friends and family, and <clears throat> go about his life, but polite persistence is doing all the work for him. And that's essentially the story that, that that page, which you didn't see, would actually display. So the third problem, right, was uh, the, the issue of prototyping. Now, if one thing you should know about prototyping, it's you should always be prototyping. Now, regardless of if you're, a, a if you're on the technology team, if you're on the business team, if your product is a, is a physical product or a digital product, you should always be prototyping. Now, that means um, if you have an idea, have a prototype for it, have images. You know, do something that can actually let the user grasp their teeth into. Um, if you have a successful product and you want to roll out a set of new features, prototype those features for the users and see what they think. Uh, the problem we had was that I was similar to this teacher up here because you know, people would ask me, oh, how, you know, how's it work? What ha what's it look like? And I would sort of answer them in the same way because that's all I had. I didn't have a prototype that I could sort of roll out to them and say, hey, listen, try it out. Tell me what you think, even on a basic level. So what happens if you don't have a prototype? Well, if it's a physical product, then get a physical prototype. doesn't matter if it's styrofoam balls and toothpicks. I mean, get, get something that people can see. Um, if, you're a, if it's a digital product and you're a developer, well, develop it. I mean, that's what you do, right? You guys are developers. I'm unfortunately not a developer, so I can't do that, which brings me to number three. So if it's a digital product and you're not a developer, then what do you do, i.e. play persistence, then go get a PowerPoint prototype. Most of us know how to use PowerPoint, and that's actually what I did when I was vetting our development team. I built an entire prototype of what we have, and I vetted it with the development team. Now what I should have done looking back is I should have actually taken that prototype and put it on our campaign page, let people run with it, and give us feedback. Everything's in hindsight in 2020, right? So um, you know, the thing we're doing now is we're actually launching our beta in mid-January. We're still moving forward with this, and uh, our beta will be out, and people can, can test run it then. So where does that leave us? Well, hopefully, if you guys are planning on running a crowdfunding campaign, you learned a few things. 
one, you learn that email list is your most valuable asset and uh, the strongest tool in your tool belt. Uh, secondly, if you're going to have a crowdfunding video that's supposed to be humorous, make sure you balance it. Make sure you focus on the story first and then incorporate the humorous aspects next. Uh, third, uh, having a prototype. Having a prototype, regardless of how slimmed down and how basic it is, is a vital aspect to getting people to understand what you're doing. They say, actually, in crowdfunding, software is one of the hardest things to raise money for. So kudos to Frugal. I mean, that's, it's really difficult because most people can't see it visually and they can't feel it. So, and there's one more thing that I'll say that <clears throat> I didn't go into. Sorry. Um, you know, and I think it's very relevant to this project is that if your crowdfunding campaign fails, don't give up. Um, you know, one of the things, and, and, and very relevant to us, is you know, be politely persistent until you get it right. Right? Um, you know, keep doing it. You know, and we know this because now, since we've done a lot of the things we said we were going to do, we have a growing subscriber base. You know, upwards of 500 people now subscribe since we've done this. And we know if we took that three month you know, time frame to prepare, we would have had around 3,000 people who were ready for this thing. <laughs> and the thing is now, we have people who are willing to back us. You know, we have people who are willing to support us. And more importantly, we have people who are believing in this product. So our obligation to them is to deliver a product that's going to be damn good and it's going to do exactly what we say it's going to do. And ideally, you know, they're going to love it. And if we didn't do that, well, we wouldn't be polite persistence. So I'm John Genovese. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, let me know.